Today is day five for the Come Follow Me study for this week, July 8th through the 14th. They never did fall away. Alma 23 through 29. Friday, July 12th, 2024, Alma 27 through 28. Chapter 27. The Lord commands Ammon to lead the people of Anti-Nephi-Lehi to safety. Upon meeting Alma, Ammon's joy exhausts his strength. The Nephites give the Anti-Nephi-Lehi's the land of Jershon. They are called the people of Ammon about 90 to 77 B.C. The Amalekites seek to destroy all who worship in truth. Alma 27, 1-3 Now it came to pass that when those Lamanites who had gone to war against the Nephites had found, after their many struggles to destroy them, that it was in vain to seek their destruction, they returned again to the land of Nephi. And it came to pass that the Amalekites, because of their loss, were exceedingly angry, And when they saw that they could not seek revenge from the Nephites, they began to stir up the people in anger against their brethren, the people of Anti-Nephi-Lehi. Therefore, they began again to destroy them. Now this people again refused to take their arms, and they suffered themselves to be slain according to the desires of their enemies. Ammon leads the people of Anti-Nephi-Lehi to safety. Alma 27, 4-14 Now when Ammon and his brethren saw this work of destruction, among those whom they so dearly beloved, and among those who had so dearly beloved them, for they were treated as though they were angels sent from God to save them from everlasting destruction. Therefore, when Ammon and his brethren saw this great work of destruction, they were moved with compassion, and they said unto the king, Let us gather together this people of the Lord, and let us go down to the land of Zarahemla, to our brethren the Nephites, and flee out of the hands of our enemies, that we be not destroyed. But the king said unto them, Behold, the Nephites will destroy us, because of the many murders and sins we have committed against them. And Ammon said, I will go and inquire of the Lord. And if he say unto us, Go down, unto our brethren, will you go? And the king said unto him, Yea, if the Lord saith unto us, Go, we will go down unto our brethren, and we will be their slaves until we repair unto them the many murders and sins which we have committed against them. But Ammon said unto him, It is against the law of our brethren, which was established by my father, that there should be any slaves among them. Therefore let us go down and rely upon the mercies of our brethren. But the king said unto him, Inquire of the Lord, and if he saith unto us, Go, we will go, otherwise we will perish in the land. And it came to pass that Ammon went and inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said unto him, Get this people out of this land, that they perish not, for Satan has great hold on the hearts of the Amalekites, who do stir up the Lamanites to anger against their brethren to slay them. Therefore, get thee out of this land, and blessed are this people in this generation, for I will preserve them. And now it came to pass that Ammon went and told the king all the words which the Lord had said unto him. And they gathered together all their people, yea, all the people of the Lord, and to gather together all their flocks and herds, and departed out of the land, and came into the wilderness, which divided the land of Nephi from the land of Zarahemla, and came over near the borders of the land. Nephites give anti-Nephi-Lehi's the land of Jershon. Alma 27, 15. And it came to pass that Ammon said unto them, Behold, I and my brethren will go forth into the land of Zarahemla, and ye shall remain here until we return, and we will try the hearts of our brethren whether they will, that ye should come into their land. Like the true missionary he was, Ammon not only taught the Lamanites the gospel, but he helped them relocate themselves on the Nephite land, where they could live in peace. In other words, he was concerned with both their spiritual and temporal well-being. Alma 27, 16-18 And it came to pass that as Ammon was going forth into the land, that he and his brethren met Alma over in the place of which has been spoken. And behold, this was a joyful meeting. Now the joy of Ammon was so great, even that he was full, yea, he was swallowed up in the joy of his God, even to the exhausting of his strength, and he fell again to the earth. Now was not this exceeding joy? Behold, this is joy which none receiveth, save it be the truly penitent and humble seeker of happiness. Elder Bruce McConkie said, Joy is a gift of the Spirit. It comes from the Holy Ghost and is granted to those who gain a remission or forgiveness of their sins. Alma 27, 19. Now the joy of Alma in meeting his brethren was truly great, and also the joy of Aaron, of Omner, and Himni. But behold, their joy was not that to exceed their strength. It was on this return journey with the converted anti-Nephi-Lehi's that the reunion of Alma and the sons of Mosiah occurred. 
Notice here, where the reunion is further described, the number of times Mormon uses the word joy to describe the feelings of those involved in the reunion. Alma 27, 20 through 21. And it came to pass that Alma conducted his brethren back to the land of Zarahemla, even to his own house. And they went and told the chief judge all the things that had happened unto them in the land of Nephi among their brethren, the Lamanites. And it came to pass that the chief judge sent a proclamation throughout all the land, desiring the voice of the people concerning the admitting their brethren, who were the people of anti-Nephi-Lehi. Your children could read Alma 27, 22 through 23, looking for what the Nephites did to help the anti-Nephi-Lehi keep their promise to never fight again. Alma 27, 22. And it came to pass that the voice of the people came, saying, Behold, we will give up the land of Jershon, which is on the east by the sea, which joins the land bountiful, which is on the south of the land bountiful. And this land, Jershon, is the land which we will give unto our brethren for an inheritance. What is the meaning of the word Jershon? Following a vote by the Nephites to permit the converted Lamanites to settle in the land of Zarahemla, the decision was made for them to have the land of Jershon. The word is taken from the Hebrew language. Jershon means the land of the expelled or of the strangers. We think it altogether probable that this significant name was given at the time it was set off for the habitation of these expatriated Lamanites, as it defines their condition as exiles and their relation to the Nephites as strangers. The name is not mentioned before this event, and would possibly be the only local name by which it was known to the compiler of the Book of Mormon. Before the date of the exodus of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's, it was, we think, considered a part of the land of Zarahemla. Alma 27, 23 And behold, we will set our armies between the land Jershon and the land Nephi, that we may protect our brethren in the land Jershon. And this we do for our brethren, on account of their fear to take up arms against their brethren, lest they should commit sin. And this their great fear came because of their sore repentance, which they had, on account of their many murders and their awful wickedness. How can we help our friends keep their promises? Your children could role-play situations. For example, what can we say to a friend who wants to lie or be mean? Alma 27, 24, And now behold, this will we do unto our brethren, that they may inherit the land Jershon. And we will guard them from their enemies with our armies, on condition that they will give us a portion of their substance to assist us, that we may maintain our armies. How might Alma's missionary efforts among the Nephites have prepared them to receive the converted Lamanites, who had been taught by the sons of Mosiah? Alma had previously called upon the inhabitants of Zarahemla to change their hearts. He also declared that the Lord sendeth an invitation unto all men. This matches a similar invitation by the Lord through Nephi, that God denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, all are alike unto God. The inhabitants of Zarahemla embraced Alma's message, and then it became necessary to forgive their enemies. They offered land and protection to the people of Ammon. President Howard W. Hunter admonished each of us to similarly forgive our enemies. Consider, for example, this instruction from Christ to his disciples. He said, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Think what this admonition alone would do in your neighborhood and mine, in the communities in which you and your children live, in the nations which make up our great global family. I realize this doctrine poses a significant challenge, but surely it is a more agreeable challenge than the terrible task posed for us by the war and poverty and pain the world continues to face. We all have significant opportunity to practice Christianity, and we should try at it at every opportunity. For example, we can all be a little more forgiving. Alma 27:25. Now it came to pass that when Ammon had heard this, he returned to the people of Antinephi-Lehi, and also Alma with him, into the wilderness where they had pitched their tents, and made known unto them all these things. And Alma also related unto them his conversion with Ammon and Aaron and his brethren. Anti-Nephi-Lehi's called the people of Ammon. Alma 27, 26. And it came to pass that it did cause great joy among them. And they went down into the land of Jershon, and took possession of the land of Jershon, and they were called by the Nephites the people of Ammon. 
Therefore, they were distinguished by that name ever after. The Ammonites are highly favored of the Lord. If you were to describe in a sentence or two the reasons why the anti nephi Lehi's were highly favored people of the Lord, what would you say? First Nephi 17, He that is righteous is favored of God. Alma 27, 27, And they were among the people of Nephi, and also numbered among the people who were of the church of God. And they were also distinguished for their zeal towards God, and also towards men, for they were perfectly honest and upright in all things. And they were firm in the faith of Christ, even unto the end. refuses to take up arms, they will be slain. It grieves my soul. We must end this work of destruction among those we love. Let us gather together this people and go down to the land of Zarahemla to our brethren the Nephites and flee out of the hands of our enemies that we be not destroyed. The Nephites will destroy us because of the many murders and sins we have committed against them. I will go and inquire of the Lord. And if he say unto us, Go down unto our brethren, will ye go? If he saith unto us, Go, we will go down unto our brethren, and we will be their slaves until we repair unto them the many murders and sins which we have committed against them. It is against the law of our brethren, which was established by my father, that there should be any slaves among them. Let us go down and rely upon the mercies of our brethren. Inquire of the Lord, and if he saith unto us, Go, we will go. Otherwise, we will perish in the land. Oh Lord, what is thy will for this people? Get this people out of this land, that they perish not. For Satan has great hold on the hearts of the Amalekites, who do stir up the Lamanites to anger against their brethren, to slay them. Get thee out of this land, and blessed are this people in this generation, for I will preserve them. arrived remain here until we return and we will try the hearts of our brethren whether they will that ye shall come into our land <laughs> I'm not sure Alma Alma it's Alma Ha! <laughs> 
Is it really you? <laughs> <laughs> It's so good to see you, man. Oh, man. <laughs> look at you. <laughs> it's been 14 years. Oh, you look older. <laughs> Amma, we have much to tell you. Many Lamanites become followers of Jesus Christ. It's good to see you, brother. Send out a proclamation to learn the voice of the people concerning admitting their brethren. Still no sign from them. Anthony for Lehi! Is that Anthony for the other? And his brother? Yeah. The mother. Antony for Lehi! This is Alma, the prophet. The people have agreed. They will give up the land of Jershon, east by the sea. They will give it unto you for an inheritance. That is not all. They will set their armies between the land Jershon and the land Nephi, that they may protect you, our brethren. They were among the people of Nephi, and also numbered among the people who were of the Church of God. And they were also distinguished for their zeal towards God, and also towards men, for they were perfectly honest and upright in all things, and they were firm in the faith of Christ, even unto the end. President Brigham Young said, We need to learn, practice, study, know, and understand how angels live with each other. When this community comes to the point to be perfectly honest and upright, you will never find a poor person. None will lack. All will have sufficient. Every man, woman, and child will have all they need, just as soon as they all become honest. When the majority of the community are dishonest, it maketh the honest portion poor. For the dishonest serve and enrich themselves at their expense. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Total morality must concern itself both with man's relationship with God and with his fellow men. In Alma, 20, 20, in Alma 27 27, we read the church members in another age who were also distinguished for their zeal towards God and also towards men, for they were perfectly honest and upright in all things. These members looked upon the shedding of blood with the greatest abhorrence. But they did not look upon death with any degree of terror because of their views of Christ and the resurrection. The gentleness and integrity that are born of the perspective of the gospel are truly impressive when one sees them in others. In this fragment of history, we see an impressive statement about an entire group who bore up under persecution in a time of tribulation without losing their love of God and man. Alma 27, 28, and they did look upon shedding the blood of their brethren with the greatest abhorrence, and they never could be prevailed upon to take up arms against their brethren, and they never did look upon death with any degree of terror, for their hope and views of Christ and the resurrection. Therefore, death was swallowed up to them by the victory of Christ over it. Doctrine and Covenants 42, those who die in me shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. Psalm 116, 
Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Quite clearly, therefore, ultimate hope is tied to the verifiable expectation of a resurrection and the better world to follow. Paul observed that if our hope in Christ pertained to this life only, a resurrectionless view of Christ, we would be of all men most miserable. In other words, proximate or immediate hope, disengaged from the reality of the resurrection, what some inconsistently espouse as a Christian existentialism, is not Christian hope at all. When we have appropriate hope of receiving eternal life, and we retain that hope through faith, then we will, even though we love life, family, and friends, have no terror of death because of our hope and views of Christ and the resurrection. Indeed, true hope springs directly from our views of Christ. No wonder the writer of Proverbs would say that the hope of the righteous is gladness. Because of the attitudinal anchor that gospel hope gives us in life, it is vital in terms of avoiding being tossed to and fro, just as is membership in his prophet-led church, which also keeps us from being tossed to and fro by every manner of doctrine. Alma 27, 29-30 Therefore they would suffer death in the most aggravating and distressing manner which could be inflicted by their brethren, before they would take the sword or scimitar to smite them. And thus they were a zealous and beloved people, a highly favored people of the Lord. How did the anti-Nephi-Lehi's change? In what ways have Jesus Christ and his gospel changed you? When have you felt close to him? How can you tell if you are becoming converted to Jesus Christ? What is the Spirit prompting you to do next? Tremendous battle brings great mornings. Chapter 28. The Lamanites are defeated in a tremendous battle. Tens of thousands are slain. The wicked are consigned to a state of endless woe. The righteous attain a never-ending happiness. About 77 to 76 BC. Alma 28, 1 through 11. And now it came to pass that after the people of Ammon were established in the land of Jershon, and a church also established in the land of Jershon, and the armies of the Nephites were set round about the land of Jershon, yea, in all the borders round about the land of Zarahemla, behold, the armies of the Lamanites had followed their brethren into the wilderness. And thus there was a tremendous battle, yea, even such as one as never had been known among all the people in the land from the time Lehi left Jerusalem. Yea, and tens of thousands of the Lamanites were slain and scattered abroad. Yea, and also there was a tremendous slaughter among the people of Nephi. Nevertheless, the Lamanites were driven and scattered, and the people of Nephi returned again to their land. And now this was a time that there was a great mourning and lamentation heard throughout all the land, among all the people of Nephi. Yea, the cry of widows mourning for their husbands, and also of fathers mourning for their sons, and the daughter for the brother, yea, the brother for the father, and thus the cry of mourning was heard among all of them, mourning for their kindred who had been slain. And now surely this was a sorrowful day, yea, a time of solemnity, and a time of much fasting and prayer. And thus ended the fifteenth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi. And this is the account of Ammon and his brethren, their journeyings in the land of Nephi, their sufferings in the land, their sorrows and their afflictions, and their incomprehensible joy, and the reception and safety of the brethren in the land of Jershon. And now may the Lord, the Redeemer of all men, bless their souls forever. And this is the account of the wars and contentions among the Nephites, and also the wars between the Nephites and the Lamanites. And the fifteenth year of the reign of the judges is ended. And from the first year to the fifteenth has brought to pass the destruction of many thousand lives. Yea, it has brought to pass an awful scene of bloodshed. And the bodies of many thousands are laid low in the earth, while the bodies of many thousands are moldering in heaps upon the face of the earth. Yea, and many thousands are mourning for the loss of their kindred, because they have reason to fear, according to the promises of the Lord, that they are consigned to a state of endless woe. Alma 40. Now this is the state of the souls of the wicked, yea, in darkness, and a state of awful fearful looking, for the fiery indignation of the wrath of God upon them. Thus they remain in this state, until the time of their resurrection. Alma 28. 12. 
while many thousands of others truly mourn for the loss of their kindred. Yet they rejoice and exult in the hope, and even know, according to the promises of the Lord, that they are raised to dwell at the right hand of God, in a state of never-ending happiness. Alma 28 tells of a battle between the Nephites and Lamanites, which superseded all previous battles in the number killed. There was a great mourning and lamentation among the Nephites. As Mormon states, it was a time of solemnity and a time of much fasting and prayer. The death of the body is not the worst thing that can happen to a person. The Lord said, Thou shalt live together in love, insomuch that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die, and more especially for those that have not hope of a glorious resurrection. The prophet Joseph Smith taught the only difference between the old and young dying is one lives longer in heaven and eternal light and glory than the other, and is freed a little sooner from this miserable wicked world. He later said, More painful to me are the thoughts of annihilation than death. If I have no expectation of seeing my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and friends again, my heart would burst in a moment, and I would go down to my grave. The expectation of seeing my friends in the morning of the resurrection cheers my soul and makes me bear up against the evils of life. It is like their taking a long journey, and on the return we meet them with increased joy. Elder Robert D. Hills of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles shared the following experience he had with a righteous priesthood leader dying of a terminal disease. My friend came to accept the phrase, They will be done, as he faced his own poignant trials and tribulations. As a faithful member of the church, he was now confronted with some sobering concerns. Particularly touching were his questions. Have I done all that I need to do to faithfully endure to the end? What will death be like? Will my family be prepared to stand in faith and be self-reliant when I am gone? We had the opportunity to discuss all three questions. They are clearly answered in the doctrine taught to us by our Savior. We discussed how he had spent his life striving to be faithful, to do what God asked for of him, to be honest in his dealings with his fellow men and all others, to care for and love his family. Isn't that what is meant by enduring to the end? We talked about what happens immediately after death, about what God has taught us about the world of spirits. It is a place of paradise and happiness for those who have lived righteous lives. It is not something to fear. After our conversation, he called together his wife and the extended family, children and grandchildren, to teach them again the doctrine of the atonement that all will be resurrected. Everyone came to understand that just as the Lord has said, while there will be mourning at the temporary separation, there is no sorrow for those who die in the Lord. His blessing promised him comfort and reassurance that all would be well, that he would not have pain, that he would have additional time to prepare his family for his departure, and even that he would know the time of his departure. The family related to me that on the night before he passed away, he said he would go on the morrow. He passed away the next afternoon at peace, with all his family at his side. This is the solace and comfort that comes to us when we understand the gospel plan and know that families are forever. Contrast these events with an incident which happened to me when I was a young man in my early 20s. While serving in the Air Force, one of the pilots in my squadron crashed on a training mission and was killed. I was assigned to accompany my fallen comrade on his final journey home to be buried in Brooklyn. I had the honor of standing by his family during the viewing and funeral services, and of representing our government in presenting the flag to his grieving widow at the gravesite. The funeral service was dark and dismal. No mention was made of his goodness or his accomplishments. His name was never mentioned. At the conclusion of the services, his widow turned to me and asked, Bob, what is really going to happen to Don? I was then able to give her the sweet doctrine of the resurrection and the reality that, if baptized and sealed in the temple for time and all eternity, they could be together eternally. The clergyman standing next to her said, That is the most beautiful doctrine I have ever heard. Alma 28, 13-14 And thus we see how great the inequality of man is because of sin and transgression, and the power of the devil, which comes by the cunning plans which he hath devised to ensnare the hearts of men. And thus we see the great call of diligence of men to labor in the vineyards of the Lord. And thus we see the great reason of sorrow and also of rejoicing. Sorrow because of death and destruction among men and joy because of the light of Christ unto life. Mormon often uses the phrase, thus we see, 
when he desired to impress a lesson upon his readers. At the end of his recital of the missionary labors of the sons of Mosiah and the subsequent battles between the Lamanites and the Nephites, Mormon emphasized two main points. One, there is a great inequality of men due to sin, transgression, and the power of the devil. Satan devises cunning plans to ensnare the hearts of men and lead them to destruction. Two, there is a great need for righteous men to labor diligently in the vineyards of the Lord and lead men back to God. List the reasons Ammon and Alma gave for their joy and choose one or more to more fully make part of your life.